All right. Well, welcome to our August 2024. Mike, we just lost your camera there. Uh, <laughs> August 2024, um, Abbeville Institute Zoom webinar. We're really excited to have you here. It's been a few months. The last time we did this, I think, was in April or May. Actually, it was in April, I believe. So it's been a little while. We had our summer schools in July, which took some time. And um, I actually had a had surgery, and so in June, so I couldn't do it then. So it's been a little while, but uh, we're we're happy to be back, and uh, we're excited to have Mike Kitchens on to talk about his book, Ghosts of Grandeur, along with some of the other things he's done. He wrote another. He was actually a co-author of another great book about Southern antebellum homes, and uh, this is a really important topic because of the woke assault on historical home interpretation. So, if you've been to any historic homes recently, uh, so let's say you've been to Monticello or Mount Vernon or anywhere, really, you're going to see that the entire story now is not about Thomas Jefferson or George Washington or Robert E. Lee or take your pick of any Southern family that live in these places. It's not the people that live there. It's the people that work there that become the center of the story. And that's OK to talk about some of these things. But the way it's been done is that we've we've distorted the the picture to make it seem like Nothing else is important but that. So, uh, and of course, a lot of our historic homes are falling into ruin and disrepair. So, um, it's a great time to talk about these things and and the current political and historical climate we're in. And and uh, Mike, of course, is an attorney in in, uh, in Georgia. He spent a lot of time doing this. We had a long conversation about uh, the fact that he'll tour. He'll go around the the South. And he'll uh, he'll be a thorn in the side of the interpreters. He'll often ask questions and uh, get them a little riled up at times. So uh, this is going to be a really interesting conversation. Now, a few things. Uh, if you want to ask questions, please use that Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to ask your questions, or you can throw them into the chat onto the right. I've got all of that available. If you do love the Institute and you like these webinars, uh, please do consider a donation to the Institute. We will be having one, I know, in October on the Confederate Constitution that will be coming up. Um, I haven't decided what we're going to do for September yet, but we are going to be doing some things. So uh, stay on the lookout for that in your email. But I'm going to turn it over to Mike. He's got a PowerPoint presentation, something new we haven't done before on one of these. Uh, so he's going to use that. I'm going to let him so he can uh, turn it over to him so he can share his screen. And so he's going to talk about uh, Southern Antebellum Home. So, Mike, I'm going to make you host. And it's it's on you. Let me see here. Do this. All right. Uh, let's see. Make host. So you are now... The host says you should be able to share your screen. Does it let you do that? I think so. I have, if I can blow it up. Let's see. I'm trying to get a full screen on this. Here we go, a little better. And... All right. There you yeah. go. It looks good. Can you see it? And can you hear me? I can. All right. I'll move on. I'm not sure I can get this to uh, share as a slide, but there we go. Um, so, Brian, I appreciate that. Um, I'll apologize to you and the rest of the participants in that I'm not a computer whiz. So uh, getting this done and doing it this way is a little bit unusual for me, but I think we may have it covered now. Let's keep going. Um, as, as Brian indicated, I, my first book I published in 2012, Ghost of Grandeur. Um, I had some uh, real good feedback from that. I've sold a lot of copies. Uh, currently, and this won't surprise many of you on this call, but uh, while I sold this book through Amazon for 12 years, uh, they no longer let me sell the book there. Uh, they don't give me a reason. They just have precluded it from being sold, not even as a used copy. Can't sell it as new, used, or collectible. So the only way to order the book now, if anybody happens to have interest, is through my uh, email address or my mailing address, which is there, and I'll do you again at the end. Um, as, in, as Brian indicated, I also co-published a book with a couple of co-authors, uh, the, the Southern Splendor. This one's not about lost plantations like my first book was. This one instead is about some of the really historic antebellum homes in the South that were in danger of being lost, but were saved and have been restored. Most of those are museum houses now. 
This book, because it was published by University Press, is more widely available. So feel free to check out your local bookstore for that. So my first book took me 17 years to write and uh, to research and write. I, I published the manuscript in 2012. And I just want to go through very, very fast because we don't have a lot of time here. And I have kind of a number of things I'd like to cover with y'all. I'm going to fly through just some of the houses that are in the book. So maybe it whets your appetite and to give you a sense of the kind of things I wrote about. The first book, Ghost of Grandeur, uh, features 94 um, uh, historic homes that have been lost in Georgia. Not all were plantations, some were city houses. And this is one of them, Hopeton Plantation. I think this may be one of the more important homes that ever existed in the state of Georgia. It stood on the uh, Georgia coast. It was built by a fellow named James Hamilton Cooper, who was Georgia's version of Thomas Jefferson. He was involved in politics. He was in farming. He was an architect. He was a scientist. He was an inventor. All of those things that Thomas Jefferson is so well known for, uh, James Hamilton Cooper was the same. Uh, he built his home after going to Europe, and, and he designed the house you see in this painting, which was painted in 1863. He also designed and built uh, two other plantation houses and Christ Church on the historic square in Savannah. If y'all been to Savannah, you know that the, it's kind of a Greek revival church. That That's one that James Hamilton designed and built. So uh, he's famous for many, many things, though. Uh, he... Uh, on, his, on the property of the co along the coast, he discovered the bones of a giant sloth, um, a mastodon, whales, and hippos. He knew the historical significance of those things. He proved for the first time that giant sloths at one time lived uh, on this continent. And he donated all of those materials to a uh, facility in Philadelphia that specialized in scientific studies, and they're actually still there today. He also was known by his, his enormous library. Uh, keep in mind that most plantation owners, even those that were well read, it's not it would be unusual for them to have more than maybe 100, 200 books in their home. Uh, Cooper had a library of over five. And to put that in some perspective, Thomas Jefferson, after the War of 1812, had about 64, 6,500 books in his library. And the Library of Congress that had recently been burned by the British uh, purchased Thomas Jefferson's library to form the core of the Library of Congress. He had 6,400 books. Well, James Cooper had 5,000 volumes. So that gives you a sense of uh, how well, well read he was and what his interests were. I could go through a whole lot more. I really encourage you to uh, um, read the story about him. There's also a book that's just about him and his father called Rice Gold that I recommend to you if you have any interest of learning more about this guy. Uh, Hermitage Plantation, also near Savannah, uh, is in the book. I, I, I add this to this presentation just to show you the variety of architecture. This one's in more of a Greek revival style. It stood very strong for many years. And what was notable about this plantation is that it was a plantation not of crops or agriculture, but of uh, brick making. The, um, the plantation produced what we call now Savannah Gray Brick. And by the time uh, of the Civil War, it's estimated that this plantation produced 60 million bricks that were shipped to Savannah and Charleston for use in, in all sorts of buildings and, and fences and gates and roadways. Um, the interesting thing about this house is that it was, uh, not only was the main house brick, which was stuck it over, but all of the slave cabins were brick. The slave hospital was brick. The, um, the infirmary and the, um, dining hall for the slaves was all were all of brick and this property is is um noted for being the having the first railroad in the south he had a brick kiln on the property he designed a rail system it was not pulled by a train as we think of it but by um uh, donkeys and other beasts of burden uh he had a wagon that's put on the rail and then that allowed him to transfer the brick in an easy way from the kiln on the plantation down to the wharf on the river where it was then shipped to Savannah and other places. So it's a pretty good story here. Unfortunately, Henry Ford uh, tore down the property, all the buildings on the property, saved the brick and built for himself another house at Richmond Hill just south of Savannah. Another important house that we lost is Dungeon S. Uh, this one's important because it was started by Revolutionary War hero, General Nathaniel Green. 
Uh, he died as construction was getting underway, but his wife, Catherine, finished the house. It was uh, a very unusual house in that it was tabby. Now, there were tabby houses all along the Georgia and South Carolina coast, but this one was five stories tall and is believed to have been the biggest or largest tabby structure ever built in America. Um, if y'all don't know what tabby is, it's, a, it's, it's sort of like concrete, but it's a little more porous. And you build with it the same way you would with concrete. You, you build a form, you fill it in with the liquid, um, uh, the liquid tabby that hardens, and then you put a form on top of that, you keep building and building and building. So a fascinating house to have seen when it was in its prime. Another home in my book is the Knuckles Ingram Mansion. This stood in Columbus, Georgia. It's a little more typical of what we think of as a Southern plantation style house. Although again, this wasn't a plantation. Uh, Mr. Knuckles uh, designed this house and built it, but he made his money in the printing business and other uh, industries. He wasn't really much into planting. Uh, in Augusta, this was a very important house that actually before I published my book, almost nobody knew about. I happened to have had a friend who knew about this house and had this photograph and gave it to me to use in the book. So this house was built by Gasway Bug Lamar. Um, it, people who visited the house when it stood talk about how lavish it was on the interior. There was no expense spared. Um, and it's unfortunate that in 1947, uh, a, a manufacturing business tore it down so that they could build their factory there. This house get, is the last one that I'll show you from my book, um, but it gets us to kind of what I want to talk about. This is the Ephraim Ponder House, which stood on the outskirts of Atlanta on the road to Marietta. Uh, it was built in 1858 as Mr. Ponder had a house in Thomasville, Georgia. He was a slave trader, but he also did some very interesting things with and for his slaves. He wanted to retire in Atlanta, so he started building this house just before the war. Um, unfortunately, the house was right on a hilltop on the edge of town, the, the western edge of town where the federal soldiers approached when they came to Atlanta. So Confederate earthworks were built, and you can see them on the left side of that photograph all around the house. Confederate sharpshooters were placed in the upper rooms of that house, and they were picking off Union soldiers. So Union um, infantry place their cannons aimed at the house to, you know, ferret out those sharpshooters. And what happened is, is they destroyed the house, of course. I'll go to the next photograph. You can see the back of the house was just blasted out by the federal cannon and shot. And you can see all the pock marks on the side of the house. But what's important about this house for the rest of this discussion is um, the fact that though he was a slave trader, most people consider slave traders the most brutal of uh, slave owners, but Mr. Ponder wasn't that. He actually um, specialized in, in trading with slaves that were trained with particular skills in different trades. And what he did is on the edge of his property there in Atlanta, he set up what I call a mini mall with a bunch of booths. So his various skilled tradesmen, his slaves, could offer their wares to people of Atlanta. And he actually allowed his slaves to make their own bargain and to keep the money that they earned from this. And many of his slaves purchased their own freedom. Well, a case in point is one of his slaves named Festus uh, Flipper. Festus Flipper was skilled in um, carriage making and carriage trimming. So he made good money. And after the war, uh, he ended up specializing in shoemaking and earned enough money to send his kid, Henry Flipper, to college. Well, after Henry was in college for a year, um, they were able to acquire for him a, an appointment to West Point. And he was not the first black student at West Point, but he was the first black to graduate from West Point. So this is a good example of how slaves were not treated the way people typically think they were treated. Let me get past that. So um, George is not the only place where we're losing in, uh, very important historic houses. We're losing them all over the South. And I'm going to fly through a few other states that have lost some that are important. This is Bell Grove, um, the, probably the largest plantation house ever built in the South. It was in Louisiana on the, on the Mississippi River. It cost just over $100,000 in just materials. Contrast that with what most plantation houses built in the antebellum period cost. A, a, a plantation that you and I would look at and say that's pretty impressive 
usually cost between five and $15,000 in 1850 and 1860 money to build. This house was $100,000 just in materials. That doesn't even include the labor to build it. So obviously a very impressive house. And another way this kind of counters what we commonly believe about plantation houses is that it was stuccoed over, but it was stuccoed in pink stucco with green trim. Pink was actually considered a masculine color in antebellum period because it was in the red you know, tones. Um, and it was not unusual for a house to be painted pink. I know of at least three or four that were. This is some of the, uh, a few of the interior shots of the house showing the extremely skilled work that went into this. We know that house was designed by Henry Howard from uh, New Orleans, a white fellow, but most of the work and most of the carpentry and a lot of the plaster work and masonry work, all of that would have been done by slaves. Another house in Louisiana that we lost in the 60s is Seven Oaks Plantation, just giving you a sense of how these things deteriorate and people don't take care of them. A very important house I wish we had saved is Briarfield. That's the home of Jefferson, President Jefferson Davis. It stood uh, just, just south of uh, Vicksburg, was left to deteriorate, burned in 1931, and now that most of that property is covered over by the Mississippi River. Mount Holly in Lake Washington, Mississippi, up in the Delta, is a house that I had the pleasure of staying in many times. One of my best friends in law school, his family owned this house. So I stayed there a number of times, but after law school, the family left the house. They left it open to the elements. And unfortunately in 2015, the house was burned under very suspicious circumstances. It was probably arson. Another very important house we lost is the home of President James K. Polk. This house stood about a block away from the Tennessee State House. Um, it, was, uh, it was where Polk went after his presidency. That's where he relaxed. It's obviously an impressive house, but unfortunately they tore it down to build another building. Uh, it's hard to believe. And then finally on this little quick tour of the South of Lost Places is Rosewell. The reason I'm showing you this one is it's, it's the large, believed to be the largest uh, colonial house built in Virginia uh, during the colonial period. Very impressive house, four stories, five if you include the cupola and uh, built very, very early 1720s but burned in 1916. So today you can visit the property. Let me get my, you can visit the property. The shell still exists. And that is in the middle of a state park. So you can actually go see that on your own, but of course it doesn't compare with what the house really was. So what I want to get across for the rest of this presentation is that the losses of, of these structures is accelerating right now. And it's accelerating for a couple of reasons. One, these properties are exceptionally expensive to upkeep. That's just a fact of the matter. Uh, they always have a problem. There's always something to fix. There's always wood to replace, et cetera. But the second thing is that they're in the current woke atmosphere, the narrative of these structures is, it kind of carries a black cloud with it, right? So people are a little hesitant to buy into these structures because they're scared they're going to be uh, vandalized or they're going to cause controversy. So they're being left to rot and that's happening more and more and more. In the next 20 to 30 years, I imagine we'll lose a good 20% or more of the antebellum structures that still remain today. So what's happening is house museums across the South. So you would expect someone like me who writes about antebellum houses. If I'm gonna write about the houses that have been lost, I kind of have to know what the houses that still exist look like so that I can understand what the period was and how things happened during the period, how they looked. Um, so I, I go to a lot of museum houses and, and make it my, my job to understand and know these houses really well. So what's happening now, and I've noticed, and y'all probably have too, is that the focus on these historic houses for many of them has changed quite significantly. Monticello, as Brian mentioned earlier, is a really good example. If y'all been there any time in the last two or three years, you know, that it's much different than it was 20 years ago. Now you have to go through a museum before you can get on the bus to go up to the house. That museum is about 70% about slaves, particularly the Hemings, but all the slaves and how they lived on uh, Monticello. Then you take a bus up to the house and at least half of the house tour is, of, is about slavery, how they lived, how Jefferson interacted with them, instead of about Thomas Jefferson. 
Well, other than maybe George Washington, who in America deserves more time to understand who the man was than Thomas Jefferson? So visitors to, to uh, Monticello are not getting a very good or clear or thorough picture of who Thomas Jefferson was because that organization who, own, who runs it is much too interested in being woke and trying to talk about the slaves. It's even worse, though, in other places. Uh, for example, uh, McLeod Plantation near Charleston, you see in the middle column, and Whitney Plantation uh, on River Road in Louisiana. They've given over almost the entire tour when you go to those houses to talking just about slavery. And they don't even represent it accurately, uh, particularly at McLeod Plantation. So let, let's talk about how some things are now. On the right, on the left side of that screen, you see the Nathaniel Russell House in Charleston, South Carolina. I don't know who of you knew, but this house has been owned by, the, I think it's the Historic Charleston Foundation, for about 80 years. It's an 1808 house. It's one of the finest houses in Charleston. Well, Historic Charleston decided about a year ago, let's sell that house. Uh, they put it up for sale. They started moving the priceless furniture and decorative arts out of the house. And why did they want to sell it? Because they decided they wanted to support climate change. They wanted to use the money to support climate change, especially shearing up the seawalls around Charleston. Well, this caused an outcry across the country uh, to save this historic house because it was just going to be sold to anybody who would buy it. The Historic Charleston Foundation backed up, they changed their mind, and they were forced to keep the house, and it's going to remain a tour house. Now, what's, what's happening to some of the decorative arts they said they were going to sell off or did sell off? I'm not sure. But in the back of the house are some slave quarters, and they're working very, very diligently to try to do the same thing all these other houses are doing and present a, uh, a, a, a much more thorough view of what slavery was like on that property. At least the house was safe. So uh, the, the house on the right is McLeod Plantation. And boy, I have a lot I could tell you about that. I went on a tour there recently. This house was only uh, put on tour uh, for anybody to see about four or five years ago. And the city of Charleston, as I understand it, owns this house. But when I went to the house not long ago for the tour, um, there was a docent there and his entire purpose was to misrepresent slavery and to um, basically tell all the people, the tourists who come there, a story about slavery that's just not true. So I've myself, I'm gonna challenge these dozens. You know, if they're gonna say wild things, then I'm gonna let them tell the rest of the people where they're getting that information from. So with McLeod Plantation, here's just a few things that docent said. While we're outside walking around the property, he told a tour group of about 14 of us, he said, you see all these ancient oak trees here? He said, you know what? They wouldn't have been here during antebellum days because the slave owners didn't want the slaves to have any shade. Well, that makes no sense whatsoever. Of course, they want, the plantation owners wanted shade. Uh, not only that, but some of these oak trees around there, you, can see, you can't really see in this photograph, but some of these trees are 300 years old. They weren't planted 100 years ago after, after the McClouds were there with, and all the slaves were there. These are ancient oak trees that have been there and you can prove it pretty easily. But this fellow is trying to make everybody believe that the plantation owner didn't want the slaves to have any shade. So then he tells a story at another post at this house about the family buying a six-year-old slave girl so that she could be basically a companion for the slave owner's daughter who was also about six years old. But the docent goes on to say that, you know, you know how kids are, they get in disagreements. And when the little white girl got mad at the, the six-year-old slave girl, the plantation owner had the six-year-old beaten. And uh, so I, I, I couldn't tolerate this. I said, well, at the, end, at the end of this part of the tour, they asked for questions. I said, how do you know that that little slave girl was beaten? Do you have records of that? And the docent said, yes, we do. And I said, fascinating. I said, what, what are those records? He said, we have census records. I said, all the census records going to prove is that the six-year-old girl was here. It doesn't have anything to do with the girl being beaten by the family. And he said, well, let's go on to the next place. Because he didn't have any um, documentation of something that he was representing as being true. 
we went on to, on that property to the back of the property where the fields were at one time, the rice fields and the cotton fields. And he represented while we were back there that the plantation owners sent all of the black people on the property into the fields to work for 15 hours a day in the hot sun, um, intending that some of them would die while they're in the fields, including pregnant women and children. So when he finished his little spiel, I raised my hand to ask questions again. Um, why would somebody who's spending anywhere between $500 and $1,500 on a slave, why would they send them into the field to die? And he said, well, they had slave insurance. Well, there was such thing as slave insurance. But I asked him, do you know how insurance works? The first time you make a claim, that insurance company isn't going to cover you any longer because you're a risk. So you can't just have slave after slave die and get paid for it. Well, of course, he had no answer for that. And then finally, and just another one more example of what that docent was telling us, talks the entire uh, tour about how cruel the plantation owners were, the McLeod family. Yet, he says when the Northern soldiers came to the property, he had the slaves follow them away from the property. But within two weeks, most of the slaves returned. So I said, huh, why, why did they return? If they're treated so badly, why did they return? And the docent said, well, we hadn't figured that out yet. Well, perhaps it's because they weren't treated the way you're representing to uh, this, this group. But think about it. This docent does what? four to five tours a day with 10 people each tour, and they're open about four days for tours. There, he's, he's affecting the inaccurately the knowledge that these people are gonna go back and talk to their friends about, about how slavery was. And it, someone has to stand up and challenge these people on what they're saying. After I had all these challenges with this docent, three of the other tour group folks came up to me after the tour and said, thank you. Thank you for standing up. Thank you for telling us the real story. We really appreciate it. And then a, a, a student, a kid who was in the group, emailed me a week later and said, I got so much more information from you than I did the docent. So I really encourage folks, let's stand up and uh, challenge some of this because they're providing wrong information. This slide is showing you Whitney Plantation in Louisiana. The owner of Whitney Plantation has opened the plantation up for tours but he states from the very start, he doesn't even try to hide it. That place is, a, is meant to simply show you what slavery was like in the South. So all of Whitney's plantation's purpose is to show you slavery. Um, I haven't gone on a tour there, but uh, I will, and I'll, I'll uh, be interested to see what they represent. I'm also finding that a lot of private owners of these old houses are changing some history. And I hate that they're doing that because it's gonna provide inaccurate history going forward. For example, uh, at a house here in Georgia, there's a slave house right behind the mansion house. And I was there recently and she said, uh, well, this was a shed or a schoolhouse. Well, I went in the, the shed or schoolhouse and I looked around, it has a double fireplace and it has every indicia of being a slave house. It was a double slave cabin. They're changing the story of the function of some of these buildings so that they don't have to say it was a slave house. Well, that's going to create an accurate history going forward for anybody who listens to that or starts writing about it. So we've got to be really careful not to change the history just to, to appease some uh, woke activists. So I've been trying to figure out what's a better way of thinking? What's a better way to represent these properties? Why aren't um, the people who are interested in social justice and, and, and anti-slavery folks, modern day anti-slavery folks, why aren't they proud of some of these structures? Because there was an, an incredible amount of um, skill and craftsmanship that went into building these houses by slaves. Masonry, brick masonry, uh, uh, um, brick masonry, stone masonry, carpentry, plaster work, uh, you name it. Um, there were skilled slaves on, on many plantations or that were hired by many plantations to build these properties. If we could get folks to be proud of that, as well as tell the story of the slaves and the owners who had been there, I think we can all agree those would be interesting places to visit that we could, again, be proud of. So what are some examples? Horace King is one. He was a carpenter, a master builder, an architect, and an engineer. He was born a slave in South Carolina. But his second owner, Mr. Goodwin, uh, took him under his wing and taught him engineering and some carpentry. 
Well, by the age of 25, King was so, Horace King was so talented that he was contracted to build a 560-foot bridge in Columbus, Georgia, which he did. Um, he worked on courthouses. He worked on the Alabama State Capitol building, which you see here on the bottom left photograph. Uh, King designed the double spiral staircase that goes up from the first floor of the Alabama State Capitol building, where Jefferson Davis was sworn into office first um, there in Alabama. Look at the skill of that work. I mean, very few um, uh, craftsmen of any type could design and build that kind of stairway. That spiral stairway goes up three stories. The other two pictures on the top show you some of the covered bridges that he built at Columbus. Um, and then on the bottom uh, right, it shows you the ironclad Muskogee, Confederate States ironclad Muskogee, which King assisted in building and designing. So this guy was talented. Uh, he had a long career both before and after the war as a skilled uh, craftsman and artisan. Some other slaves, uh, I mentioned earlier Festus Flipper at the Ponders, uh, at the Ponder House in Atlanta. Uh, Thomas Day, he was actually born free from uh, parents who were former slaves in Virginia, but he was a famed builder, carpenter, and cabinet maker in Southern Virginia and North Carolina. And there's been at least one book, if not two, published about his works. His furniture that he built is now currently in extremely high demand. So he was highly skilled. Jim, uh, John Hemmings at Monticello was said to have been a very skilled carpenter. And we just discussed Horace King. So I found this excerpt from a, a excerpt uh, below this. It, the list of slaves at Mount Vernon in 1799, the year George Washington's death, reveals that of the 184 slaves listed, more than one quarter were described as skilled workers. Well, that fits in precisely with um, the authors, what the authors of uh, Time on the Cross discovered when they uh, analyzed slavery in the South. They said the same thing. About 25% of slaves in the South were skilled at some trade. So many people had this idea that every slave on a plantation was sent out to the field and um, asked to pick cotton or, or rice or, or cut down sugar cane. No, many of them were skilled and used for their, tra their skilled trades. So some of the false or misleading, narr misleading narratives offered by many of the docents around the South are, well, look at that mansion house compared to the slave houses. Or the plantation, plantation owners lived a life of complete and utter leisure while slaves were made to work every waking minute. Or slave owners looked for opportunities to treat slaves with cruelty and disdain, like what they said at the McLean, at, excuse me, at McLeod Plantation in uh, near Charleston. Well, that's, those are all simply false narratives. They're not true. Um, the facts are is that really most white Southerners were much more living like uh, in, in buildings like the slaves were living in than in the mansions. Probably only 10% of white Southerners lived in what we would call a big, nice house. The rest were, there was a very small middle class during that period. So most of the white Southerners lived in very, very small, modest homes. Some were even shacks. Some were considered shanties. In fact, the term cracker was used in the antebellum times to indicate somebody who lived in one of these small shacks or most of them didn't even have uh, wood floors. They were dirt floors and many didn't have glass in the windows. So in some cases, slaves lived in better conditions than some of the white folks did. So when, they, when a docent presents this narrative of look at that mansion house and now look at that slave house, keep in mind that the vast majority of white Southerners didn't live in the mansion house. They much more lived in conditions like the slave houses. Why aren't more of these modest structures existing today that we can see and look at? Well, because they were small, modest, and not good in shape. So those are the first buildings that people let either deteriorate or they tear down to build something else. So it's just not there. Well, how come there isn't more written history about this? Well, our good friends from the North who invaded the South tried to, in burning down houses and courthouses and libraries, they kind of made sure that we're never going to have enough records of this to prove it because most of the records and, and journals and diaries that would have indicated who built these places, um, how they live, all that, a lot of that was burned up. Look at this slide. So we got nine photographs here of, of small, modest houses. 
I bet most people on this call would look at this and think that a majority of these were slave houses. No, every single one of these houses was the home of a white person, a white Southerner, uh, across the South. Every one of these pictures is from different states. Compared to, look at this. Every one of the uh, houses in this photograph were all slave houses. Uh, two of them here are log. Uh, three of them are a brick. That's just what I, you know, I just, these are ones I found in my collections. And then on the bottom is a whole slave row of frame houses. So, and in, in, there is no poor Southerner, uh, poor white Southerner, who ever would have had a brick house to live in. I mean, that's just something they could not have afforded. Um, they didn't have the skill to build it in most cases. So in, in, in at least some cases, I'm not representing all, but at least some cases, slaves on plantations had better living conditions as far as housing than many poor white Southerners did. Some didn't, I understand that. Some lived in horrible conditions, but I think that's a, a real minority of those who um, were slaves in the South. So I'm gonna draw a close to it at this point. I just wanna represent to you that those, those ideas that when you're at a historic house, if you know a lot about history, challenge some of the docents so that the other people on the tour don't take away wrong notions uh, in, the, uh, in the same way that people are doing it now. If you give these woke docents wide leeway, uh, their narrative is going to be the narrative that everybody believes, not the narrative that we, most of us, know to be true. So um, keep that in mind. Keep some perspective in mind when they're trying to show you the differences in the plantation owner versus the slave. And I think we'll all um, enjoy a better learning experience from it. Now, let me see if I can... Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Mike. You can, uh, you know, if, you, if you'll if you stop sharing your screen, then up at the top there, make me the host again. And we'll, uh, we'll get to the Q&A part. Okay. And then if you scroll over my name, you little three buttons, it'll say make host. Should be there now. Let's see. There? It'll, it'll, it'll tell you that it. Yes. It yep, you there now. All right. Yep. I'm the host now. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that. Um, and I'm, the pictures were, were really uh, fantastic. Some things that I thought of when you were going through the presentation, first of all, the Russell house in Charleston, a lot of people don't realize Russell was not from Charleston. He's from Rhode Island. That's right. And he was a slave trader. And of course, he had connections in New England uh, because of that. New England, uh, Newport, Rhode Island, and, and that area of New England was a heavy slave trading center. So he was able to leverage those connections there in Charleston to make a heck of a lot of money on the trade itself. And so um, when you're talking about a house that's <laughs> that's an antebellum Southern home, you do have a Northerner living in that house, which is an interesting story. Um, you mentioned Horace King. I actually live in that area. So Horace King is actually discussed quite a bit around here. Uh, there still is one Horace King bridge, from what I understand, across the Chattahoochee. I can't remember where it is, but he's, there's still one existing bridge. Of course, the bridge, the, the main bridge that he built in Columbus was burned in the Battle of Columbus. So um, torn up, uh, they tore up the planks and burned it uh, when the Union tried to cross the Chattahoochee. But um, he did uh, help supply the lumber for that ship, which is actually the CSS Jackson. It's the uh, which is in the uh, the Naval Museum there in Columbus, and um, he actually sued uh, the state of Alabama and the state of Georgia to get his money that he wasn't paid uh, because, of course, they ran out of funds there, and he won. He won a court case, and he paid for the headstone for for uh, Goodwin. He was yeah. his uh, his owner. He actually purchased with his own money. Uh, the the headstone for him. So that, Horace King is an interesting story. And then one other thing I was thinking about, a couple of things you mentioned, Time on the Cross, which if you don't know, and this is just for the audience listening, that's Fogel and Engerman, uh, the very famous book on slavery. There's two important books uh, written in that around that time period. One is Fogel and Engerman, Time on the Cross. The other is Eugene Genovese's Roll, Jordan, Roll. Uh, both of those books are considered seminal works. They actually take different perspectives on slavery. Time on the Cross is much more interested in an economic position, which was a highly capitalistic society, that there was certainly an economic motivation behind this. Genovese is a paternalist, uh, so this is all about paternalism and extended family relations. So they look at slavery in different different ways, but 
they're both are, I mean, just full of information about the institution itself and uh, economic situation, the the social and cultural situation, all of these things. So it's really remarkable. A um, couple of things I was thinking about uh, as well. Uh, in Columbus, you um, the Wolfolk family plantation, is that in your, I can't remember, did you have that in, in Ghosts of Grandeur? It's not, it's still there. Um, one of the Wolfolk houses, uh, five oaks, is in the book. Okay. But the Wolfolk plantation that now is where the military base is, I've never found a photograph of that particular house. So, Well, there's still one in Columbus. It's right behind WTVM. It is. Um, and in fact, this is a funny personal story. Years ago, it was up for sale, and uh, I pretended like I wanted to buy it so I could just go through it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was, uh, it was up, and it was... It's in a, not a very nice part of Columbus now. Um, it's in it's th that area used to be really beautiful. Um, it's just kind of uh, become an urban area, kind of run down, it, and um, it's just not as nice as it used to be. But it has been restored somewhat, um, and it is a, a pretty home. In fact, but some of the things have happened, like all of the crown molding, the plaster crown, have been torn out of it. Um, just some things have been done to it. Uh, but uh, John W. Wolfolk actually has a relative that was killed in a duel in Fort Mitchell. There's a grave over in Fort Mitchell from one of his his son who was shot and killed in a duel right there. Uh, and when they used to go to Alabama to duel, they couldn't duel in Georgia. So they go over the, go down to, to Alabama. Um, so that's interesting. Um anything uh, as far as you know, Columbus has got a lot of history, and I know you mentioned Columbus. Um and because that's near where I am. Um, what's your favorite, you know, maybe one of your favorite houses there in that Columbus area? That's uh, on, that's available for tour or just? Or just, I mean, in general, you know, as you're doing your research, it may be one that's not there, one that is there. I don't, I don't know if there's too many that are available for tour in Columbus anymore. They've uh, The Historic Columbus Foundation has uh, basically sold off all their properties. There's no more Westville. That's, that's now defunct. So um, what do you, what do you have? The Rankin House there is still open for tours on occasion, and it's also a very cool house. But I, if you ask my favorite of those that stand, I think, uh, is it Ridgewood out from town uh, near Eupatoy? Okay. Uh, beautiful place. I've met the owner recently. She let me in the house, and uh, it's, it's an extremely impressive house. It's just off of Highway 80. Uh, it's in, now in a neighborhood because they sold off the property around it, but that's a a really impressive house of the houses that have been lost and that are in my book, uh, the James, the James Jackson house, James Jackson was the, uh, post-war governor of Georgia mm -hmm. appointed by the reconstructionist, I think, but his house was absolutely incredible. And there, I now have found a lot of pictures of his home. And then the uh, Fontaine house that used to be right down by the river in downtown Columbus. So, uh, Columbus was really, uh, if you've ever been in Natchez, Columbus at one time in the Unabellum South was a lot like Natchez. It was absolutely full of wealthy people's homes. And then as you as you skirt out from the city, there were these 100 properties with a nice house in the middle of it that they called country houses. But um, that whole area was just rich with architecture. Yeah, the one home that they actually still have, the historic Columbus, where you can go tour, it's uh, the Walker Peters Langdon house. I don't know if you've been through it, but it's a... Um, it's the oldest home in Columbus. It's actually a modular home, basically. They rolled it into place. They built the the foundation for it, which is a basement foundation, and rolled it into place and uh, on Broadway there. Um, and it's a it's a middle class house. It's basically uh three rooms with a hallway in the middle. That's it. Uh they do have a slave cabin out back that they moved to that property from another part of, of uh the area. Uh, there is also, they call it the trader's cabin there that they had. They've now moved that to a different spot in Columbus um, that they, it's uh, you know, from 18th century Muscogee County. It's uh, just one room. I mean, so you get the uh, the impression, again, not everyone lived in these big homes. Now that Walker Peter Langdon house, the, the initial owner of the Walker family, uh, didn't have it very long and they sold it to the Peters and they used it. It was their city home. They had a plantation home and they would come into Columbus and use it as their city home. But, um, you know, it's, you've got the Pemberton house, which is right around the corner from that. Right. Which is only been... three or four rooms itself, I think. Right. Well, it used to be a two-story house. They, they right. lopped off the, the second floor and now it's a privately owned home. But again, it was a small house. It wasn't very large. 
Um, and if you don't know, John Stife Pemberton invented Coca-Cola. So that's that's why that house is interesting. But there's a lot of neat stuff uh, in Columbus. You're right. It was such a, a well, very wealthy area. Um, and you have all that interaction with the other side of the river. That was Indian territory at one time. And so you had uh, you know the, the back and forth there. Uh, I don't know if you ever knew Bill Cawthon, but uh, Bill Cawthon from Eufaula, Alabama, used to, he knew everything about Eufaula. And he would, if you went with Bill, he could show you every house in Eufaula that was privately owned, that this family owned that. And it was, it was just wonderful to walk around with him. Uh, of course, he died several years ago. But um, again, a lot of these homes are still privately owned. And I went with him one time and he knew people. So he'd just say, hey, let's go knock on the door. And we went and said, oh, here, here's your home. Yeah, you can walk through and see what's here. Um, it was, it was quite interesting. So, um, now, uh, let me see. We got a couple. We have some questions here, and we got a few minutes, so let's see. Okay. Um, the Abbeville Institute shared a poem by Francis Story Tickner titled The Old Hall. Does anyone have information on the antebellum home of the Tick that Tickner wrote about? Um, do you know anything about Tickner? I mean, I can answer some of this, but if you know anything about Tickner. No, I've run into the name, but I don't know anything about him in particular. Okay, well, his home was actually on Fort Benning. It was called Torch Hill. Um, okay. There's a I know marker Torch there Hill. for it. Yep, yep. And um, but that's what he wrote about. And he was he was writing about his house that essentially became destitute when he became destitute when the war was over. And so um, you know Frank Tickner wrote the Little Geffen, which is uh, the most, most famous poem that he produced. But Paul Hamilton Hayne liked his poetry. He was a a, a doctor. Um, you know, served in a hospital during the war. Um, but a, a pretty interesting individual. But um, yeah, I mean, his home was swallowed up essentially by Fort Benning or now Fort Moore. But, you know, it's for, it'll always be Fort Benning to me. It's uh, yeah. I know they changed the name, but it, it's for some people. It's hard to I mean, you still hear people say Fort Benning. Uh, but, you know, you drive down the road now going to Columbus and there'll be you can still see where it says Benning. They just kind of put more over top of it. It's kind of funny. Um, the Benning still lives on. Well, Columbus from Columbus south going down the Chattahoochee River. At one time, that was nothing but plantation after plantation. And the three places that I always wanted to find an image of that I've never been able to find were Esqu Esquiline Hill. I don't know if you've heard of that plantation I have house. Not. Um, Torch Hill, like you said, and then uh, Wolfock's house, which is right in the middle of where they say it's where the Commandant's house is now for the for Fort Benning. But there's never been an image that I'm aware of that's been discovered of what that house looked like. We had a guest on, and he actually goes out and uses the U.S. Geological Survey. And he goes and he he says, if you know how to do it, because they survey all this stuff, you can actually see the outlines of the houses mm. and fortifications and other things. He does it for military stuff from the 18, uh, 1860s from the war, and he finds fortifications. But he said, you can actually find other things if you know how to do it. You can find the outline of those of those homes. So maybe that's there. I, I don't I don't know. I'd love to see the the the. Uh, uh, William uh, Barclay's house, of course, it was Berkeley, but Barclay is how they, but uh, they're in, in Virginia. That would be great. Of course, it's gone Greenspring. It's, it's been gone a long time, but some of these homes like that would be amazing to see too. Uh, question, do you have any recommendations for visiting plantation antebellum homes where the woke narrative doesn't prevail? Yeah, actually, um, I was trying to think if there's any, uh, you go to Nottaway Plantation, which is currently the largest plantation house that still exists. Um, the last two or three times, it's also a bed and breakfast, but you can tour the house. The last few times I've been there, they, they gave no, um, undue notice to slavery. In other words, they gave a balanced presentation that was interesting about the owner of the house. And then of course, all the people who live there and how it got built and how the money was made and all that. Another really good one also on river road in Louisiana is, um, uh, evergreen. Uh, in fact, my docent there was a young black girl. And she gave one of the best tours I've ever seen, I've ever been to anywhere in the country. She was, uh, and, and I don't know if you know about Evergreen, but it's, there's the manor house right up along the river. And behind it is still all of the old slave cabins and rows along of Slave Street. So they still have probably 25 to 30 slave cabins uh, behind the house, as well as other outbuildings. And they give a very fair, very accurate presentation of what slavery was like and what the homeowners were like and what they needed and how they lived together and what they did together. Those are some in, uh, in Louisiana, um, in Alabama, go to, um, Gangswood in Demopolis, Alabama. Uh, that one offers a great presentation about the house. The arch it's mostly about the architecture because it's such an unusual house. That would be a good one to go to Belmont in, um, Florence, Alabama. 
is a real good one to go to that has not changed their story and, and tried to focus on the woke stuff. Um, in Georgia, the governor's mansion still does a pretty, the old governor's mansion in Milledgeville, their tours are still pretty good about not getting too heavy into that where it's kind of uh, skewed or boring. Lockerly Mansion, and also near Milledgeville, um, that's, Lockerly's in my second book, they do a good job of just showing you the house, telling you what happened there. So there are still places a, a, a around the South that have not gone the woke route. Let's see. Uh, question: Do you know anything about Hank Williams' old mansion? Uh, I don't. I don't know anything about it. I would assume it being Lower Alabama, but no, I don't. I don't. I don't. Uh, oh, you, maybe. No, yes, yes, I do actually. Hank Williams owned uh, a plantation house outside of Franklin, Tennessee, when he moved to Nashville. And that house was later owned by Tim McGraw and um, his wife. Um, Faith Hill. Faith Hill, yeah. They owned a, an enormous property that actually had two plantation houses on it. One was the lot, and the other was this house. The house that we're talking about that Hank Williams once owned is now for sale, and it's actually been being threatened with demolition. Let's see. A question. I have a copy of, of a book named Brooks of Honey and Butter, Plantations and People of Meriwether County. Yeah. Uh, ask you, have you ever heard of that book? Is it any good? I have several copies, and if you can get a copy, buy it. It is. Uh, it, it, the, the author is now passed away, uh, William Davidson. It is a fantastic book. It gives great history, uh, good photographs, uh, and it's very rare. If you can get a copy, I'd say get it because there will never be another copy made. Uh, let's see. Um, question, where are the docents getting their information from or their script? I mean, are they just making this stuff up? How much, how many, how much do the people that get elected to sit on boards of these historic places influence how these narratives are given? I mean, where does this stuff come from? Well, the, that's a good question. The docent that I saw that gave me so much wrong information I don't know where he gets that from. I do think some of it's just really made up. I think it's it's intended by the docent to call the to cause the tourists there to ooh and on and kind of gasp at how cruel things were. But here's another example in a in a historic house that's for tour on tour. Uh, whenever you want to go there in Madison, Georgia, which is very near where I live, it's called Heritage Hall, big beautiful Greek revival house. Some friends of mine went there and said that a a young black girl was the docent. And she gave him a tour of the house. And she said, you see these uh, scratches in the wood floors? And the tourist said, yeah. And she said, well, that's from the chains that the slaves had to wear while they were walking around the house. Their ankles were chained together. And, and the scratches are where the chains scratch the floor. Well, that's obviously not true. Uh, that didn't happen anywhere. So I called the owner of the house, the, the organization that owns it. I told them what's going on. I said, are y'all teaching them that? And she said, no. Where, where did she get the information? And the owner of the house said, I don't know. She must have made it up. She said, thank you for telling me. Well, that docent got fired because she was providing wrong information. So sometimes if you stand up for this stuff and you let the owners know what they're saying, uh, corrections can be made sometimes. Um, question. Are you familiar with the old state capital in Louisiana? I am uh, kind of a Gothic style building. Um, I have not been inside of it yet, but it's been greatly remodeled um, with probably late 1800, early 1900 um, design work. Not all of it's still antebellum. Uh, let's see. Do you have any recommendations on how historic structures might be preserved aside from direct purchase and subsequent restoration? Anything else that could be done to help preserve these properties? Uh, besides personal ownership, private in, property? In theory, I mean, you can encourage your local historic society to raise money and purchase these things, and that way that society could run it as they want to. But you can also work through organizations like the Georgia Trust for Historic Preservation. There's a South Carolina Trust. Uh, most states have something like that. In Alabama, I think it's the Alabama Historic Commission. Um you can go to those organizations and ask that they talk to the homeowner and try to put a conservation easement on the property. If they put a conservation easement on the property, it prevents future owners from changing the property in a way that would um, be detrimental to its historic value. Question, what are the prices of your two books? You know, one you can get on Amazon, I know, but the one that you sell 
uh, through your website there for your, through your email address. My email address. Yeah. I've, I've closed my website on it, but the, uh, through the email address goes to grander. That's my first book, $25. That includes the shipping costs. No big deal. Um, I think that the university press of Mississippi is selling the second book for the, in the $40 range, I believe. And every once, once a year, the university press of Mississippi books on sale for 40% off. So if you catch them when they're on sale with through the press, you can probably get it for more like twenty five or twenty six dollars. And it's uh, I have both of those, and they're great. Um, they're just fa- they're I mean, if you just even like to look at the pictures, they're fun to do and go through and just uh, wow, that's amazing. You know, you get to see these old photos. Thank you. Um, question um, from uh, one of our actually one of our summer school students. Uh, the question is, what do you think is my survival rate in Charleston's dose of community if she is not doing this kind of, you know, woke uh, narrative? If I consider doing anything in regards to historic home education, will I have to capital, uh, capitulate to the woke narratives these organizations are pushing or should I just give up on that? Well, whatever organization house you're a docent in, they're going to have a script that they're going to ask you to read many, many times so that you can spout it out when you're doing your tours. Um, if they own the house, then yeah, it, it doesn't hurt to push back a little bit, but if they insist on you sticking to the information in the script, it's kind of either work there and do that or don't work there. But that's the only, that's the only thing I can think of. Yeah. I mean, it's really difficult. Uh, you are at the mercy of, you know, if you're, it's a private organization in particular, I mean, you're hired by them. So you, you do what they tell you to do or you don't have the job there. So, um, you know, it's, we're, we're in a difficult time, uh, but I, I mean, I think that there's, as you mentioned in your presentation, and I like how you concluded with that, we have all these wonderful things really to talk about. It doesn't have to be either or. It can be both. And I think that's the important thing to say. There is a rich history here and, and a lot of uh, what we consider reconcil- reconciliationist language that we could use in these things. You had white and black Southerners living together, working together, doing these things for a long period of time. And there is it, this this is not uh a a situation if you have to tell the story about the white family or the slaves you can do both in a very positive way and it doesn't have to be um uh, the way we're doing it now so uh there is a positive story to tell about the people that work there and the positive contributions to southern society that they that they provided uh it's not to minimize the impact of slavery or things that and and it's not to say that this is a you know a, a great institution we all know that we're happy it's gone Absolutely. To say that these people offered nothing when they had skilled workers, people that were really contributing to Southern society is something that's valuable to say about these places. And also, of course, the families who were important for the economy, the politics, the society of the area in which they lived. That's also an important part of, of the Southern story as well. So it's important to get all of that in there. And it's unfortunate we're in a situation now where people think we have to pick one or the other. And it just doesn't have to be that way. The four that I mentioned in my presentation, the four slaves or former slaves that became so well known for their skills, uh, that's just the ones we know about. Can you imagine how many there actually were? It's going to be a very large number. And it's just sad that we don't have more information on who those folks are so we can celebrate their skills. Right. And, I, you know, as I mentioned, Horace King is getting a lot more attention now in this area. Yeah. Uh, because of his uh, his role in the economy of, of the Chattahoochee Valley right here in, in Phoenix City, was now Phoenix City and in uh, Columbus, Georgia. So um, it's uh, I think they've actually renamed the uh, the thir- the Dillingham Street Bridge, the Horace King Friendship Bridge, I think is what sure. it's called now. Um, so, uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff here to talk about and we could probably do this for another hour, but we are up against the time. So I do appreciate everyone that came on. And uh, and participated in this presentation. And again, also thank you, Mike, for for coming out and doing this with us. And uh, we'll, we'll we should probably do this again. We can get into more stuff and talk about some specific uh, some specific homes, if I could speak tonight, Absolutely. and uh, really get into these things that are uh, you know related to maybe an individual house and how these things work. Uh, you you know the Louisiana plantations and the sugar plantations are amazing stories because yeah. that's really where the money was. Yeah. Right in the 1850s, uh, people were were really making, starting to make a lot of money on sugar, and those plantation homes were pretty amazing. So, anyways, uh, I'd be Mike, happy to do it. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, I appreciate you coming out, and everyone else, thank you for coming out tonight too. And uh, we will see you for the next presentation. This will be available afterwards. We'll we'll post a, a link to it, so be on the lookout for that in your email. But we'll see you for the next one. Have a good evening. Thanks.